Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is better. So I'm um, sorry for having kept you waiting. Um, I'm here with my colleagues and Moncler Camus. I'm um, here introducing and moderating this webinar of the Business Network for Innovation, which is under our NSOE uh, Research and Development and Innovation Committee. Um, and it's there to foster links between the TSO community and startups, academics. So um, this is another edition of those webinars. Um, I will start right now by introducing um, what we want to talk about today, which is Powerfax Europe. So um, as you can see, this is a little agenda. I will just um, uh, talk about why we um, have this Biofax Europe initiative. And then uh, Suzanne Nice, the Managing Director for Strategy and Communication, will talk about Biofax Europe, what is in it. Then we've got Mark Chete from um, our market uh, section. We'll talk about the transparency platform. Simeon uh, Akspiel on our economic studies, then Colin Broderick on um, the maps. And then finally, we'll uh, uh, allow you to, um, to you know, ask some questions and, and make some comments before uh, we conclude with Suzanne on what is coming next. Um, so um, in terms of um, why we did Powerfax Europe, uh, we did it because um, one of the pillars of our and so his strategy, if you'd like, is about developing transparency and trust. Um, so the idea behind developing transparency and trust is also about injure, um, enabling customers to get engaged in the power sector and have good uh, data, sound figures that they can, uh, you know, um, extract and build their behaviors on. Uh, so um, what we provide as and so we as an association different products to injure or um, enable transparency we've got power maps that Colin will touch upon we've got power platforms like the transparency platform we've developed apps like the network code app and we have publications um, Simeon can t uh, talk about the economic studies and there is one that I would like to highlight it is the business zone a technical report which gives you a lot of information about how the power system is now um, being in some areas uh, congested. Uh, here we also have the Powerfax uh, Europe publication that we launched uh, uh, in, the, in the month of January and which Suzanne will uh, now take you through. So thank you for your attention and uh, without further ado I give the word to Suzanne. <laughs> Many thanks, Claire, for this uh, this introduction. Uh, let me briefly uh, talk you through what is in uh, in the Power Facts Europe uh, report. So, uh, first of all, uh, as Claire was saying, we wanted to enhance the analysis and the transparency of the wealth of data that NSOE already has, and in doing so, we have suggested to uh, take six strategic dimensions of the European energy transition uh, that adds up to the three already existing, which are, of course, sustainability markets and security of supply, and takes, let's say, the three dimensions that come in, uh, from the clean energy uh, for all Europeans package that are digital, that are customer, but also for us, very important, the infrastructure. NSOE uh, is uniquely placed uh, to offer sound data concerning the wide energy system and uh, my colleague Marchetta is going to share with you later on information on the transparency uh, platform Simeon Hagspiel on NSOE's modeling in the future. I give you now some insights into how we produce this report that will come out on a yearly basis the next, in the end of this year, uh, in our 10-year NSOE celebrations, uh, so the methodology, but also some insights, what is the outcome of this report. Uh, starting with the sources that we have, you see uh, from the 10-year network development plan to the surveys on ancillary services, market coupling and forward capacity allocation reports, 60% 
of our data have made it to that report, or 6% of the report are our data, to put it like that. And of course, we also use some external data, for example, European Environmental Agency, for example, of course, the authoritative ASA market monitoring report, Eurostat, or the EU Energy Poverty Observer. Um, so as I said already, we have been combining what we could call the tra traditional dimensions with the new ones as set. Um, the framework we are positioned in is, of course, the one of decarbonization as set by the Paris COP21 framework. And here, the TYNDP, 10-year network development plan, a team looking not at 10 years horizons, but uh, nowadays 2040 in the next one already to 2045 has done uh, scenarios that are compliant with the COP21 and looks uh, into different sets with a huge degree of stakeholder involvement and interaction with other players like NSOG or with, of course, the European Commission. And here you see where we would land. Um, investments is absolutely crucial and we understand today that uh, without um, developing the network, there is no way to see a decrease in emissions from today's levels to what is expected to be minus 80% by 2040. The sustainability, let's see uh, some of the elements of the outcomes of our report um, here in this section, sustainability. So what do we see? Uh, the carbon intensity of the European electricity production has seen a tremendous decrease uh, till uh, the last year of data 2016. However, when you look, uh, especially UNFCC reports, uh, where we are today in decarbonization, the picture is more than alarming. And it's more than alarming because other sectors, transport, uh, aviation, uh, industry are not following a trajectory that has been successfully, to large extent, made by Europe's electricity sector without saying that we are already there. I'm far from stating anything like that. Um, we see here uh, on the carbon intensity again uh, of the European electricity, the trend uh, up to 2016 and where we need to go. Uh, energy efficiency, this needs to be underlined. The target will not be made by 2020, while Europe will see a successful implementation of the two other targets, CO2 and also of the renewables development, not on energy efficiency. The ambition has been stepped up for the next decade. There's a clear need to step up efforts on financing on regulatory frameworks for getting the story right. Uh, the installed capacity of renewables, as I said, we are going to make it for that target of uh, the 20%. Uh, the TSOs need to be uh, congratulated for having uh, enabled the 54 uh, gigawatt extra installation of wind and solar in a system, which means nearly doubling a comparative uh, US solar capacity addition, addition during the same period. And we all know the ambition is even bigger for 2030, where we would then see something like 50%, 46 uh, at least renewables in the power system. Uh, we also should uh, underline the customer participation in balancing markets. Many people look today at balancing markets that are 1% today of the overall market volumes, but gets increasing attention. And here we see on this slide that countries like, uh, uh, like Spain or France or Italy already have uh, the participation, while other countries still have to catch up in this sense. That's what the clean energy package is looking at. And let's not forget about one important uh, part of the story, which is energy poverty. Not all is fancy and fantastic. We see nearly 10% of Europe's population not having access to decent energy services. And this is rightly so in the attention of a newly established European Observatory for Energy Poverty. And NSWE has been very active to contribute 
to getting this started. Security of, security of supply is of course uh, at the center of TSO's attention. Uh, and here, uh, of course, on the on the TSO grid transmission system operators uh, grid, we haven't seen a major incident for the period 2017, despite the increasing share of removals and the increasing challenges of mentioning uh, of managing the system. And so this classifies, as you see on this slide, incidents according to three scales, being scale being a, a wide area incident, uh, while scale zero is anomalies, scale one is uh, noteworthy small incidents. We have seen two scale two incidents and 390 scale one incidents in the report period. Congestions are a reality in the European grid. And uh, certainly also the uh, situation with the 70% now capacity at borders is one of the results of trying to get Europe's power network more fluid and more market-based. Uh, congestions are a result of a suboptimal system today, are the result of uh, the need for developing new technologies like storage, of improving the MySAT management, of improving forecasts, avoiding curtailment, diminishing redispatch costs. Germany and the UK have had the highest remedial action costs in the last three years. These are data that come from NSOE's transparency plan. Uh, regional cooperation is extremely important in NSOE's uh, in the power system at large and has been enforced, and rightly so, through uh, the Clean Energy Package for All Europeans. You see on that slide that the service providers to uh, NSOE's member, members are uh, mitigating on a yearly basis something like 4,000 are proposing actions to the TSOs, 4,000 such in Coreso, uh, or 130 multilateral remedial actions that have been coordinated by Munich-based TSCNET. Um, what about market integration? When we look at market integration, we see, according to the ASA, the latest of the ASA market monitoring reports, uh, the regional price convergence that uh, has been seen uh, in all the areas, the Baltics, Southwest Europe, in the Nordics, in core, uh, and uh, in the yeah, Southwest Europe. Um, and we also see that in the balancing markets, a major milestones have been achieved in 2018 on these pilot projects called Mari Terra, and we see a potential saving of 400 million euros a year once this is implemented, according to a report that we have been released on uh, balancing market integration in Northern Europe. Uh, the infrastructure. N3 has released a report that is called uh, the cost of the N3 power system 2040. And here we have a no grid scenario. If ever we are not developing the needed grid for the energy transition in line with the set targets for 2030 and COP21, then we will see uh, that the Europeans will pay 40 billion euros year by year as of 2040. We will waste more than 150 terawatt hours of clean electricity, and we will also see the risks to security of supply increase. Therefore, investing in infrastructure is clearly crucial for Europe. I should say here also that we are looking increasingly into sector coupling, making the best of the combined networks of gas and electricity. Most projects, according to the TYNDP 2016 and 2018, are on track. You see here that from all the projects, 148 are in time. But we should also say that uh, we see projects delayed, very often public opposition, and some rescheduled for other reasons. We need all of those to avoid, as said, the huge expenditure related to the cost of no grid. 
On the European Interconnection Target, we also see progress, uh, and we will see a step up in the ambition with 15% of interconnection for 2030 in line with the set targets. We can't insist enough on the need for more innovation. And here you see uh, that uh, the investments by the TSOs in innovation aren't good enough. Let's be very honest. We can blame, and we should blame, that regulators are not recognizing in some of the countries the cost for innovation, research and development. However, there's also a need on company side to step up efforts. We're going to share our insights in the next edition of InnoGrid, where DSOs and TSOs share the projects they undertake on innovation in the network business. Uh, the cyber physical grid is something that is the topic of our next report on the digital grid. Cyber physical means not that the physical grid is going to be replaced by a cyber grid. It means that we are going to see a combined grid, physical plus cyber, where cyber is instrumental to optimizing the physical grid. Uh, the investments are paramount in the TSO world and in NSOE into cyber physical and will be further step up in architecture on the NSOE side, CGM, the common grid model being one of those. Also the transparency platform will be further boosted. Software is extremely important. All this will make it to the NSOE innovation roadmap 2013. 2022. But let's also highlight new risks emerging that are cybersecurity and that need to be managed between uh, the TSOs and between NSOE and the relevant uh, policymakers, looking at examples, for example, PGM in the US. Uh, let me finish here to invite you. It's a very nice slide. Seeing the balloons, I'm not sure it's going to be the same light sky in November in Finland, but uh, the light atmosphere will be there, 10 years of NSOE, uh, and here we are going to share already first insights of the next edition of the Power Facts that are going to be better, because you are going to provide us your feedback and your insights, what you think about this first edition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for this uh, nice overview. I will now uh, move to um, Mark Chete, who will talk to you about the transparency platform now and in the future. Mark, up to you now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Claire presented, I'm going to give you a quick overview about the, the Ansui transparency platform. I will start with the background. We'll touch the current status and we'll also shed some light what's coming in the future. So I think as Susan mentioned, transparency has been always really, really important for TSOs and NSOE. And even before this transparency platform, we had uh, several platforms on which uh, TSOs could publish on a voluntary basis several information for interested market participants. And realizing this uh, European Commission adopted the uh, regulation 543, which mandated NSOE to set up the and so a transparency platform. The regulation also requires the data providers and data owners to submit the information to this platform, which is a significant step towards the implementation of the internal energy market. Since this is a central platform, everybody can reach it. Uh, it's free of charge and uh, it publishes information on a non-discriminatory basis across the whole European Union. This obviously uh, reinforces the benefits of the network codes uh, as we publish more information than in the beginning or stemming from the network codes and uh, have the market participants to, to uh, set their portfolio uh, close to real time. What else are we uh, mandated to do? So in this regulation, NSOE is asked to uh, basically prepare all the relevant technical and uh, business documentation of the platform based on what everybody can submit the data. 
and based on what the users can understand what is really published on the platform. I don't want to go into all the details. We have uh, several documents that you can see on the screen, but these are the key documents if you are a user, depending on uh, you are using the graphical user interface or you want to download the data uh, by your IT system. But how the data comes to the platform is another really important question here, because as you can imagine, the, the data owners are not always the ones submitting the data. So the, the regulation requires that generator companies, power exchanges, allocation offices, DSOs, TSOs, and even market balancing operators, or even consumption units, make sure that the data is published on this platform. So they submit the data to either to a national or a regional provider, which uh, provider, following the rules that we set, submits the data to uh, our platform. So as you can see, there is a long uh, journey for the data from the owner to the transparency platform. And on the other side, who are the users of this platform is basically uh, everyone out there, but uh, the regulation targeted more uh, market uh, mar trading uh, companies but also journalists, uh, academic people, and also uh, NGOs. So what data do we have at the moment is uh, basically what you can see on the screen. I don't want to go one by one, but I will uh, maybe name the main domains that you can see. So we have obviously information on the generation load, also really uh, information related to counter training and uh, redispatching. We have a, a separate section for outages of either transmission grid, grid elements or a generation or consumption uh, unit, which data items are uh, really crucial for the market participants so that they can really see how the market uh, evolves. Uh, on top of this, we have uh, all the transmission related information, mainly uh, from uh, capacity allocation uh, and calculation. And at the end, we have uh, the balancing related information, which is the last uh, time frame of the market. What has happened since the go live? So the, the platform went live in the beginning of 2015, where we had a bit of a gap in terms of data completeness. But as you can see from 40% uh, missing data, now we are at 20%. We are not happy here. We would like to reach uh, the 100%. So I will talk uh, about what additional actions uh, we have taken so far to, link, uh, to reach the 100%. The number of files that the platform receives uh, more than doubled over the four years. And in the meantime, there was another regulation under the force which uh, asked Ansui to submit all the information that we receive uh, from data providers to Acer. Acer is the regulatory body and uh, they monitor the market to avoid uh, misbehavior and market abuse. So the platform also serves the information to this body so that they can carry out their market monitoring uh, task. The registered users from the initially uh, 700 we had, now we are above uh, 13,000, which shows uh, an obvious interest from the user side in the data that we publish. And it's not only the users, uh, that increased, but also the number of data providers increased uh, significantly, mainly due to the fact that the scope of data that we, on the, on, we have on the platform uh, has increased. Uh, obviously, if we have uh, so much data on the platform, it's also important to have it in a very, very good quality. Strictly speaking, as I mentioned, by the regulation, we are not responsible for the quality of the data that we have, but we realize this is uh, extremely important for the data users, for everybody uh, using the transparency platform. And uh, on top of this, Ansui also has uh, this item in the strategy. So good quality data and available data is, is key for, for TSOs. Building on this uh, uh, feedback and uh, strategic items, Ansui adopted uh, an Ansui data policy which was uh, implemented on the transparency platform. So what do we do in the frame of uh, this data policy? We try to improve the data quality and also we try to make sure that the data can be freely reused 
by the users of the transparency platform. In the first step, we managed to get all the TSO data uh, freely reusable by the users of the transparency platform and we just updated our terms and conditions uh, in the beginning of January. So from now on, 80% of the data from the transparency platform can be downloaded and freely reused without any uh, prior agreement of the data owners. We are working further on this with the non-TSO data owners and as soon as we reach uh, an agreement, we will update uh, terms and conditions further. But we didn't stop here, but we also built internally several uh, reports that we sent to our uh, data providers so that they can react on the findings of these reports. So what we do, we send them weekly uh, reports related to data completeness. This report points out the missing data that we have on the platform. Uh, we send a report on data processing, showing how well their data was processed by the transparency platform. We also monitor the availability and the uh, outages of the transparency platform that may happen during the operation. Plus, we also send uh, warning reports to our data providers to show how well they reacted on the warnings that the platform sent to them. The whole idea of sending these reports is that uh, the data providers uh, analyze the, the information which is available and they correct or complete the data on the platform. What else you can expect from the transparency platform? Since the, go since the entry into force of this regulation, uh, there were several guidelines and network codes entered into force, which all require some uh, information to be published on the transparency platform. So the next one coming is the new data item stemming from the electricity balancing uh, guideline. This will basically uh, overlap with the information we already have on the platform, but uh, will give you much more detailed information about the bids, about the prices, about the state of the system, about the rules of the, of the balancing markets. The first uh, new data publications will be appearing from the from the middle of December uh, this year. In terms of the system operation guideline, we also have uh, TSOs have uh, several requirements uh, to publish new information, and it varies from uh, agreements to the, the operational values. The first new information will be published uh, in June. 2019. So as you can see, the scope of data on the platform is uh, growing and growing. And uh, we expect uh, other guidelines also requiring new information on the platform in the near future. And uh, as one of the last steps, we, we run uh, a user group with our transparency platform where the user friendliness of the platform was uh, criticized a few times. So we wanted to take uh, some actions on this. And as you can see, there are a few uh, mock-up screens on the left side of the screen how, showing how the new graphic user interface of the platform will look like. We are in the middle of the project, uh, but the proof of concept part has been finished and uh, is accessible for everyone. Uh, interest who is interested we are expecting uh, feedback uh, from uh, all the users which will be used for the uh, final part and the finalization of the of the new graphical user interface the expected go live of the completely new user interface is uh, 2020 and basically that's all uh, related to the transparency platform so i will uh, hand over the floor to claire mm -hmm and uh, she can redirect us to the... Um, maybe one, one thing, Mark, because I, okay. I see there's, there's a couple of questions coming through um, on the transparency platform. Maybe you can um, answer some of them already. Um, one thing is about how often the data is updated on the transparency platform. Does that depend on the, on the data itself? Or? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the deadline by when data owners have to submit the data and have, we have to publish it is set by the regulation but most of the data that we have on the platform is published close to real time so what is the time range is uh, 
it depends. If it's a forecast data, then obviously it's before real time. But if it's uh, an operational data, then it, sometimes it's within the day. So we have a few data items for uh, four hours after real time. Sometimes it's just one or maximum two days after real time. And uh, one question, I think you clarified this, but uh, um, why can't information owners submit directly to the platform? They can if they wish to do so, but for uh, efficiency reason, uh, the regulation uh, sets this uh, data provider role, because imagine we don't exactly know the number of data owners out there, because it cha it, it's changing from one day to another, depending on the generation companies existing today. So it would be really difficult for NSOE to manage thousands of data providers. That's why this data provider role is uh, is established in the regulation, but it's not an obligation. Each data owner can become a data provider if they wish to do so, but uh, for efficiency reason and also to avoid IT development in each uh, small company, it's beneficial to have data providers. And um, one thing is about whether the platform, as it develops, will kind of uh, eliminate the need for system operators to report directly to Acer. Well, double reporting, I think, is always a very, very good question. And uh, as all the EU regulation asks to, uh, to avoid it, uh, I do hope, hope so. But I could imagine that ACER and the national regulators uh, would need a bit more detailed data from the TSOs and also maybe uh, not in an anonymous way, but more uh, with clear identification of the market participants. But it really depends on the on the nature of the request of Acer. Acer and the NRAs do use a transparency platform and they try to avoid uh, asking the TSOs directly mm -hmm. in case the data is available. Okay, and uh, one maybe for the long-term question is uh, whether at some point you will publish information that is owned by DSOs or... Yes, absolutely. We have uh, this uh, vision internally within uh, NSOE. So basically we have a project, uh, TP Vision, to basically transform the transparency platform from a regulatory platform into a market-serving tool. And within this project, we are exploring options, what the users would like to see in X on top of the available information. And the information from DSOs is uh, obviously one of, the, one of the crucial items. But again, one part is having the need or having the wish to have this data. We have to make sure that DSOs also have sufficient interest in publishing the information. So this is where we play a a coordination role and we try to make sure that the needs and the wishes are uh, met. Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on. Um, there, are, there were more questions but uh, we'll make sure to answer them uh, either during this webinar live or, or by email. Um, so now let's um, give the word to Simeon actually about the economic studies in NSOE. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Simeon. I'm happy to, to speak to you today um, about the economic studies at NCE. And um, in contrast to Transparency Platform, which is by definition um, focusing on, on historical data, statistical data, real observable data, um, one of the principal objectives of the economic studies team is actually to, to produce counterfactual analysis and prospective data and studies. So looking ahead, looking at design changes, uh, looking at quite a range of diverse and complex challenges that um, TSOs, NCE, but also other stakeholders in the power sector are facing. Um, so this here is just a, a very uh, incomplete mapping of, of, of topics where we see the growing need to actually uh, come up with a more sophisticated analysis, more insights, and, and, and basically better decision making. Um, which uh, requires uh, sophisticated use of data, um, sophisticated analytical techniques, and, and uh, certainly a lot of business intelligence. And this is um, where um, uh, this team uh, tries to kick in and support. Um, it's a cross-sectional team, which was formally established in early 2018, so still quite, um, quite young. 
Um, it's uh, ramping up quite uh, rapidly um, um, during the recent months. Um, and the objective is basically to unite the market and network modeling activities um, by, by uh, developing uh, data models. Um, and as I outlined already, mainly based on fundamental market and system models with a focus on prospective planning, adequacy, and market design questions. So uh, just to give a concrete example right ahead, so for instance, the TYDP is uh, naturally one of the main deliverables where we as an economic studies team will contribute with uh, our expertise and our efforts. Uh, but also, for instance, the midterm adequacy forecast, which is also, as you might know, for the timeframes uh, 2020 and 2025, um, so prospective uh, analysis, we, we are also uh, very actively contributing. Um, uh, broadly, we can, we can differentiate between three main areas of activity. So um, the first one would be data. Um, so data collection, quality and consistency, interfaces and usability. We do build on transparency platform data, um, but due to requirement to also cover uh, uh, future expectations, um, we are um, obliged to take a, um, a look beyond and, and for instance, um, rely on our TSO members to come up with a, um, a good estimate of how uh, systems will develop. Um, in terms of modeling, um, we, we do build on uh, mostly fundamental market models. So we do try to represent uh, um, the, the, the system with uh, its technical and economic properties to um, to the best possible detail. And uh, we build those models um, per definition um, uh, for, for pan-European perimeter. And of course, we also need to solve those, uh, those models, for instance, um, to provide an estimate of how markets will develop um, in, in, in the years to come. A very important part where we emphasize a lot is uh, analysis. So apart from producing um, a, lo a lot of lo lo lot more data, we also attempt to make better use of this. And uh, there are techniques, for instance, visualization, interactive maps, um, uh, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it's about interpretation. So not only displaying uh, figures, but also actually understanding them, modifying pictures to make them better understandable for broad audience. And of course, putting it in, in, in nice and, and understandable reports and presentations, which at the end of the day, uh, really are understandable for, for experts, um, but also for broader audience. And at the end of the day, um, facilitate uh, decision making of, of the decision making authorities. I would like to give you some some more insights um, into uh, the data and modeling portfolio that we are currently having. So as I was outlining already, um, we, we do per definition look at the pan-European perimeter. And uh, um, I would say that the, the basic data and modeling frameworks that we have um, are the ones depicted on the left and right hand side. So we, in terms of market modeling, we have um, uh, kind of a standard tool, which is a zonal market uh, aligned with the current bidding zone delimitation and um, um, uh, yeah, aggregated on that level uh, information with respect to generation, with respect to demand, um, but also with respect to the, to the um, network. On the right hand side, you see the common grid models for planning studies. So as you might know, in the, in the context of the TYDP, we do publish um, a planning, our detailed planning models, really going down to the substation level, line by line, um, circuit breakers, etc. Uh, these are available for the, uh, for, the, for the synchronous areas. What we also do um, increasingly is uh, we are developing further our environment um, by uh, providing more details um, and, and, and do a unit by unit, branch by branch representation in our market models to tackle uh, questions such as uh, redispatch, um, uh, capacity calculation, um, sharing of auxiliary services across borders, which are uh, requiring, requiring a, a certain level of disaggregation with respect to as I said already, generation units, um, also grid elements um, that go um, uh, beyond the, the zonal delimitation. The timeframes uh, are depicted here uh, as well and are, are pretty much in line with uh, the MUF and, and TYNDP environments. 
The computational facility that we use for that, um, we, we uh, were able to build up um, a computational facility which enables NSUE to, to very closely collaborate with its TSO members. Um, so we have, um, in a so-called demilitarized zone, we have a high-performance computing environment um, uh, with a backup system also in place, which can be accessed by NSUE staff, but also uh, by TSOs, and, and um, apart from the IT, interest uh, this this is also to depict um, how closely we are collaborating with our TSOs on those um, on those items and uh, yeah to really take into account the broad expertise that we have here as an association last but not least I would like to give you a short insight into one of the studies which is also um, uh, cited in the Power Facts Europe 2019 so you will find the, the, the figures on the right hand side on page 17 of the report and um, this is basically to give you an insight of what it actually requires to come up with uh, such maps which might look straightforward in the first place but if you if you start uh, um, posing questions how those figures were actually produced, you will see that um, it, it requires a whole lot of um, uh, effort, data and, and, and modeling to actually provide those numbers. And on the left-hand side, uh, you, you see which kind of data and models are actually needed to provide those figures um, for the midterm adequacy forecast in this context, so probabilistic analysis of what could happen to the system in the years to come. Is the system adequate? Is the system reliable? and um, uh, assess the balance between uh, generation and, and, and demand fundamentally, but taking into account quite a broad range of it, uh, additional items such as uh, availability of generators, where we can also, for instance, build on transparency platform where we have uh, a statistical uh, data in terms of availability of certain, of certain generators. Uh, we can build on, on climate data um, from, from past years, but um, uh, talking about climate change, we are also increasingly forced to actually project the climate into the future because it might indeed look different and adversely affect system operation and adequacy. Um, on the demand side, um, uh, similar principles apply. So, of course, we do not know what exactly demand levels will look like in the future, but we are doing our best to come up with solid estimates and, and sophisticated models to uh, provide good estimates here. So this is just to, to give you an insight into how some of the figures, specifically the prospective figures um, for, for the future years um, are, are produced. And that's already it from, from my side. Um, so I give the floor to the next presenter. Thanks for the attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Simeon. Um, I can't see right now uh, some uh, some questions about your presentation, but uh, they will come, and, and for sure I will uh, I will sure, make sure that uh, they get to you. So uh, now it's up to uh, Colin Broderick, who is um, going to present our maps. So Best setup <laughs> okay. for now. <laughs> for now. Um, okay. Good afternoon um, from Brussels. So my name is Colin Broderick, and uh, today I'll, I'll present to you an overview of the. <clears throat> the various maps that NCW produces and an idea of maybe our, our future plans. Um, also followed by a, a view from the outside world that it's not just focused on, on us. Um, so the first thing really is the main product that people see that we produce is our European transmission map. Now this is produced in collaboration with MedTSO and all um, our, our transmission system operator members. Um, previously, this was only produced as a, a wall map that you put up on your wall. It was A0 in size, it looked very impressive, but it, 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 it kept a lot of details hidden. So uh, two years ago, we, we came along and decided, right, we're going to make this available on the web and allow people to zoom in and zoom out um, and be able to see um, additional details that might be hidden in the map that are not available on the wall. Um, so the main one is that's on the website. You can filter to see different views. So if you wish to just see the um, cross-border lines only, that's possible. Um, and that will allow you to, to get a, a good idea of who's interconnected to who um, uh, across Europe. So the other thing that we have is um, with the 10-year uh, network development plan, so the TY NDP. Um, for the past two editions, we've, we've produced uh, interactive maps, which display the, the various projects that, that make up the TY NDP. 
Um, and for this year, we, we improved things a little bit more so that you can use the map to get to the, the project sheets for each project. Um, you can also filter them based on their status, uh, the country they belong to, um, and at which horizon they, they may be available uh, or may uh, come on stream. So it's available on the, the TUNDP website. Um, it's pretty easy to get around so, and, and receive some good feedback from uh, our stakeholders. So the next thing, just to give a very quick technical overview of um, what, what went on and how, how did we get these on, on the web. So in the case of the, the main map, we, we use some proprietary tools, so from the main GIS vendors, so GIS being a geographical information system, um, which is Esri and their ArcGIS server. And with that, we have an online application where our members can go online, they can draw the features on the map they wish, uh, categorize them as, as, they, as they please, and to get some authoritative data online on the map. Then what we do is we come along, we extract that to a more modern kind of format that's easily uh, translated. So this is called GeoJSON. Now there's a picture below that should be there of both compiled to vector tiles, but uh, it seems to be missing. But that's it. Just shows that we we create layers, um, and then from that we upload it to a service called uh, Mapbox. And from here, this allows us to style the maps um, to change the style on the fly. So that's how you get this nice, smooth animation as you zoom in and out of, of the maps. It also allows us to add um, more open data in the background. So in this case, it's from OpenStreetMap. So we've got uh, up-to-date base layers that um, give you context as to where the information is. And then finally, we take those map tiles and we publish them on our website um, on the viewer that you see uh, uh, online. Um, and it's a similar process for, for the other kind of maps like TUANDP as well, except we leave out the, the Mapbox step. Um, so just in terms of future plans, basically we wish to open up our data a bit more, um, and especially because the data that's on the map is, it's not very detailed, it, it's quite basic. It's simply what is the category of line, what is its voltage, um, where might it be, and which stations that it connects to, and of course, because it started life as a wall map, it means nothing is in its real geographic location. In many cases, it's 50, 100 kilometers from its, its, its place. And the reason for that is it was always meant to be viewed at a fixed zoom level from a, from a distance on the wall. Um, and we also face the difficulty that in the various member states, there are different regulations relating to the publication of grid data, and that precludes us from publishing um, the grid for certain areas. So we haven't been able to overcome those yet to publish the, the entire map for reuse by people. Um, and then the next thing is that we'd like to, we have a lot of different areas are defined, especially for the, the market areas that come from transparency platform. And these, of course, are not very, um, I'd say they're a bit opaque if you don't know where they belong to and where you assign them to. So we'd like to publish some maps that you can use in combination with the transparency platform data that you can now reuse as you wish. Um, and then this should also help you with various system development and TP um, published data to make new visualizations. Um, so just in terms of the to publish the area maps, um, the main thing is it's a bit difficult to see here, but it's a little bit complicated. Um, so not only do we have member states, we have control areas where certain countries can have up to uh, five different control areas within them. Of course, they don't follow uh, administrative boundaries, so it makes it a bit difficult. If we then look at bidding zones, for example, in Denmark, Denmark has two areas as a bidding zone, but is only one country. Um, similarly, for Italy, Italy is a complicated case. We can have up to 15 different areas that represent different parts of Italy at different aggregations. So we're trying to make this a bit more understandable by producing some, some visuals to allow people to, to grasp what is the area we, we refer to. Um, so these will be coming in, in the next few months. We're still trying to figure it out internally how best to do it. Um, the next thing is also just to use some more abstract ways to present the transmission system. So um, our colleagues in system development previously developed uh, this map on the left, um, which is basically each circle is a country. It shows the interconnections between each of those countries and the various proportions of generation um, that uh, each country will have depending on the scenario for TV and MVP. And then the two images on the right, are we're looking at different ways to present the um, 
let's say, the transfer of information uh, or transfer of uh, power between uh, different countries. So in this case, we take take away the geography, but allow you to at least get context by seeing the shape of the countries, which you might recognize more so than the internal name that we might have for, for this information. Um, so that's all well and good. Our hands are tied in a certain way. Um, and I want to show that there's not, it's, while we can be an authoritative source, there are other places to get information and data on the, on the transmission system. So the first place um, I'd want to say is, uh, I've already spoken a little bit about OpenStreetMap. So there's this other project called Open Infrastructure Map. And what that is, is it just extracts all of the power and telecoms information that is in OpenStreetMap and exposes it as a map that you can view. And in this case, it's quite interesting because Europe is covered very, very well um, and quite accurately in, in certain areas. Um, so if I go to the next slide, we'll see just how detailed it can get um, for certain areas. So this is looking at a uh, duo in Belgium. So it's a nuclear power plant in the north. Um, you can see every tower for the transmission line is represented, even the individual transformers, um, the bus bars. You have the different categorizations of line. You have the area that represents the, the uh, the generation station itself. Um, and then you also have the, the other infrastructure that's in the area, so maybe the DSO level kind of lines as well. Now, the thing to point out here is that it's not ready for reuse exactly at the moment because it doesn't include any nice references that you can join with data we might publish or data that our members also publish. But with some work, it's, a, it's another, another way to visualize the information. And the thing to remember is that this is people who volunteer their time to provide this information and not just um, the authoritative source. So that's Open Infrastructure Map. You can click on the link at the top and you can explore Europe at your, at your leisure. Um, and basically, that's it for me. So thank you very much. And back to you, Claire. Thank yeah. you, Colin. That was a very nice uh, overview. Um, and indeed, the maps are, are attracting a lot of attention quite rapidly. So um, thank you for managing this. Uh, for questions and comments, I think that um, we have done some live uh, answers to most of the questions. I'm looking at Suzanne. And uh, Mark, are you? I think they're, they're, they're managing the, the, the questions as I speak. So, um, so I don't think there is anything. Thing more, we can maybe elaborate on some of the questions. Just picking some, maybe each of those who have responded, just pick some of the answers and highlight it a little. Yeah, maybe Mark, if you want to start to summarize a bit, no? Uh, yeah, we had a few questions related to the transparency platform. Um, Related to yeah, uh, basically on top of what Claire already uh, announced in my during my speech. Um, yeah, there was a, there was one question about whether, um, yeah, yeah whether we we plan to improve the RESTful API uh, in the transparency platform. Yes, as I mentioned during my presentation, the number of users of the transparency platform has increased significantly since the go live, and uh, that obviously showed some uh, restrictions on uh, replying all the technical needs from the user side. So that resulted in a restriction of the number of API requests that we can manage from the transparency platform side in order to avoid that the, the platform slows down. Our technical colleagues are working on uh, improving this and uh, adding new infrastructure, new servers, or have uh, better connections. As soon as we have any updates on this, we will obviously inform the users. Um, there was one uh, additional question. What benefits do registered TP users have? A very simple one that uh, if you want to download the data on the graphical user interface, then uh, you have to be logged in. So that's already, uh, I think, uh, quite important one. Um, I can maybe answer one of the questions that I saw. That was about Brexit. There was a question asking, and maybe Simeon wants to complete me on that one. Yeah, the question was good. It was saying, uh, would the physical flows change with, Bre with the Brexit if there was no deal? Yeah. So first of all, we need to highlight the connection to uh, the UK is a DC line. Yeah. So 
So it's not a, it's not a the part of the continental European uh, system, yeah. Uh, and of course, this is an unprecedented case if ever it happens. A uh, hard uh, Brexit, Brexit on 29 of March, yeah, in which a country that has uh, the same level of legislation in many senses is leading uh, on climate and energy is getting out, yeah. And of course, all depends then what are the rules of the game on both sides of the the the, uh, the channel, yeah. Uh, that will be applied, and uh, what is the interest of N3, but uh, even more so the policy makers, is to avoid that we go to bilateral trades in which, uh, let's say, Belgium uh, with UK, uh, Norway with UK, etc., everyone applies different rules. Ideally, we would maintain the high quality and high level of security of supply and interaction through a decent framework on energy, and our actions of N3 have always been pushing for having energy been seen as a major good uh, for the EU and also uh, for the UK. So there's not much to add from my side. I mean, we, we, I, I, I do believe we will remain committed to uh, making best use of the infrastructure that we have on both sides of the channel. Um, of course, it will depend on a number of rules, uh, specifically market rules, because it's essentially the market which drives the physical utilization of our infrastructure. Um, but from a TSO and NCE perspective, we are certainly committed to make best possible use of it. And uh, one one thing um, relating more to, to Colin or in general about the information that we publish on the network. Um, um, so when we publish maps or, you know, <laughs> is there any security uh, concerns that uh, we publish all this information? Just halfway through writing a response. Oh, sorry, that, excuse me. But, uh, <laughs> saves me the effort. Um, so, yeah, uh, our members have raised various concerns um, specifically related to security, and there are various regulations that govern this. And this is one of the reasons why we haven't been able to open up the data at all. Um, but our members are quite happy that we publish the grid map as is because it does not represent, it is a more an illustration of the current grid situation and not um, uh, an accurate representation. So I hope that answers the, the question. Thank you, Colin. Um, there was yeah. one related to the transparency platform uh, asking whether we think that all data owners are fully aware they should report their data, are, whether we are able to reach out to the data owners to increase their performance when it comes to data reporting. Well, again, we do our best, but the bodies that we are in contact with are the data providers. Uh, on top of this, the NRAs uh, have this national role to make sure that everybody uh, fulfills their uh, legal obligation. We do have uh, cooperation with the NRAs to see where they think there is a gap in relation to uh, data provision to the transparency platform. And then uh, we double check whether the information comes from that country, from that uh, segment of the of the market, or not. Um, on top of this, uh, we also discuss with our TSO members, who are mainly uh, the data providers, uh, to make sure that they receive uh, all the data that they think they should receive from the from the data owners on a national level. These are the two channels via which we. We try to make sure that everything is published. But obviously, the number of data owners is changing from one day to another. So that's that's a really difficult uh, task to, to monitor. Thank you very much, Mark. I um, think we covered pretty much all questions. Um, so I will give the word, the conclusion to, um, to Suzanne for if you want to add anything. And then uh, maybe. Um... No, I think what is really important, you get a flavor of N3's uh, desire and tentative to really share data, to be transparent. Uh, and our membership is strongly with us on this one. So please, stakeholders, uh, academics, experts, uh, policymakers that you are, challenge us, contribute, ask these uh, very good questions that you are asking, and help us to make this next report even better, and as this has been taking place now in the framework of, from Claire already introduced, business network of innovation, yeah, 
uh, run by the RDIC. Uh, I uh, have uh, Joana here uh, who is uh, managing this uh, business center for innovation to share with us what is the next uh, event that comes up. So the next time we will be seeing you on the 28th of February when we will be talking about uh, storage. The webinar is called Storage as a Flexibility Tool. And we have uh, Michael Lippert from Ease and SAS Batteries coming, and also Felix Dempsey from Sunland. So, see you next time. Yeah, that's a great, um, another great uh, webinar with a great topic what storage uh, can offer uh, um, as far as flexibility is concerned to the, to the system. So, we look uh, really um, much to you joining this and uh, another edition of this PNI uh, webinars. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending uh, this one, and uh, I thank everybody um, here, all my colleagues who have, uh, who have presented uh, their topic, and um, have a very nice afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.